really happy to uh, introduce to you Richard Becker, who is uh, actually the West Coast coordinator of the Answer Coalition. And if um, any of you are, are not familiar with the Answer Coalition, it's um, an anti-war, specifically anti-imperialist coalition of over 100 different organizations. It stands for Act Now to Stop War and End Racism. And um, actually, uh, Answer was founded immediately after 9-11-01. Uh, um, and sh uh, shortly after that, I believe it was on September 29th, uh, mobilized um, a huge demonstration. And since then, Answer has consistently organized the, uh, the biggest anti-war demonstrations um, in the United States. And actually, we're right now gearing up for a, a big uh, national march on Washington on March 20th. And I'm going to be getting people to sign up just to be on Answer's mailing list so that you'll be in touch with us. Um, we're going to be doing um, a national march on Washington, like I said, which will be easily tens of thousands of people. We're hoping for over 100,000 people. And then there will also be coinciding marches in um, LA and San Francisco, which of course uh, Richard will be working on. He is a very, very busy man, and um, he has a lot, I think, to say about Palestine, so I'll give it to him for now. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, and I want to really thank Monkey Wrench Books and all of you for coming tonight. This is probably about the, I don't know, 42nd or 43rd event we've done as part of this uh, book tour. We just published the book in October. This is the book, Palestine, Israel, and the U.S. Empire. Uh, and <clears throat> we're in our second printing, which we're very happy about. And the uh, book is getting around. And I want to talk a little bit tonight about what the book really aims to do and some of the features of it. You know, what we've gotten in place of the real history of what's gone on that's created the situation in the Middle East today, not just in Palestine, but the broader Middle East, is really a lot of myths. And what the book aims to do is not be a new groundbreaking academic study or something like that, but when I've spoken about this issue over the last several years, people have said to me, what's a good book that's a starting point? And it's been, there was a book that came out in the 1970s called Our Roots Are Still Alive about Palestine, but it's pretty out of date. So what I really set out to do was to write that kind of book. And the comment I've probably gotten the most from people is, it's clear, it's, it's easy to read. And I consider that very much of a, of a compliment. So I want to talk about what some of those, what some of those myths are. And uh, the book aims, in addition to being something that's clear and uh, for people who are kind of new to the subject and, you know, but interested, but also to be kind of a handbook for activists, to be useful to people uh, who are engaged in this issue and talking about this issue. Um, I want to talk about a couple of news items, though, in the last two days. Yesterday, <clears throat> there is an organization in the West Bank called Badil, which is a Palestine, Palestinian uh, right of return organization. And they produced a, a survey that they've been working on for the last two years, 2008-2009. And the survey says this, that of the 10.6 million Palestinians in the world, approximately, of course, uh, 6.6 million of them are registered refugees, meaning that they are refugees themselves, <clears throat> most from 1948, many hundreds of thousands more from 1967, or they are the descendants of the people who are refugees, some of whom, many of whom are still alive today, and they're registered refugees, registered with the United Nations. And another 427,000 Palestinians are internally displaced persons inside the state of Israel, meaning that they were uprooted from wherever they lived uh, and, and lived somewhere else there. So that comes to a total of a little over 7 million out of the total population of 10.6 uh, million Palestinians in the world are refugees or internally displaced persons today. And I want to talk a little bit about how it got there. I also want to say that I saw today a YouTube of President Barack Obama at a meeting with a lot of students yesterday in, in Tampa, Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Did anybody see this? Yeah. <clears throat> it was probably, I think it was safe to say, uh, the least articulate moment of President Obama's political career. Because a Palestinian <laughs> student asked him, she first said, I worked on your campaign, I supported your campaign, I support a lot of what you've been doing, but if you support human rights, why aren't you saying anything about what the government of Egypt and Israel are doing to the Palestinian people in Gaza? 
All First right. of all, I'd like to say that I did work on your campaign. I think it's great what you did for the community because you involved us as the youth to understand the grassroots movement and That's what great. impact it can make. Thank you. My question is, um, last night in your State of the Union address, you spoke of America's support for human rights. Mm -hmm. Then why have we not condemned Israel and Egypt's human rights violations against the occupied Palestinian people, and yet we continue to support financially with billions of dollars coming our from our tax our dollars? Taxes. The Middle East is obviously an issue that has plagued the region for centuries. Uh, Israel is one of our strongest allies. It is a vibrant democracy. It shares links with us in all sorts of ways. Uh, it, it is critical for us, and I will never waver from ensuring Israel's security and helping them secure themselves in what is a very hostile region. As a first step, the Palestinians have to unequivocally renounce violence and recognize Israel. And he seemed to like, it seemed to take the breath out of him, really. And, um, and he, the answer he gave was that, it was a very stock answer, but it took a long time. But the answer was, well, Israel is our friend. And it's our best friend. And, you know, we have the same values and we have to guarantee their security. But it's very interesting if you really dissected what he said. He said, first of all, the Palestinians uh, have to uh, <clears throat> renounce violence and recognize the state of Israel. And then when he talked about what the Israelis had to do, they didn't have to do either one of those things. There was nothing about their violence and nothing about recognition of the Palestinian state. Uh, and this is the kind of typical, very typical of what the the standard line is. And the other thing that he said, which is really kind of coincides with what's been the starting point of my presentation, is this. He said, well, before he said any of that, he said, well, <clears throat> everybody knows this has been going on for centuries and centuries. And that's one of the great myths. Yeah. And here's an illustration of the myth, and this, this is how I started the book. Uh, a year ago, January 22nd, a little over a year ago, January 22nd, 2009, Two days into uh, his presidency, President Obama appointed George Mitchell as the new envoy to the Middle East. And he used to be a senator from Maine, and in the 1990s, he was the chief U.S. Uh, envoy negotiator in Ireland, Northern, in Northern Ireland. And he talked about how the conflict there had been going on for 800 years. You could put it a little bit differently than, say, maybe the struggle against British colonialism has been going on for 800 years. But that's what he said. So then... When, when Mitchell was introduced at the State Department, all the bigwigs were there, and the media was there, and President Obama was there, and then he told a quote-unquote joke, quote-unquote. And this is the joke. Just recently, I spoke in Jerusalem, and I mentioned the 800 years, referring to Ireland. And afterwards, an elderly gentleman came up to me and said, did you say 800 years? I said, yes, 800. He said, ah, such a recent argument, no wonder you settled it. And see, that story, that joke, was greeted with a lot of laughter from the people there and knowing nods because they all know, like President Obama said today, that, you know, this hasn't been going on really just for 800 years. It's been going on for thousands of years, the conflict between Arabs and Israelis or Muslims and Jews. This is the conventional wisdom that's so widely accepted and so widely uh, perpetrated, I would say, on the people of this country. And the only problem with this well-known fact is that it's false. It's completely false. It's not what's really been going on. Uh, and uh, it really is not only false, but I would submit that, and, and a large part of my book aims to, at making this point over and over again, that uh, it's letting somebody off the hook. And who it's letting off the hook, and, and, and maybe not in the name of a person, but what it's letting off the hook is the real cause of the problems in the Middle East, the real root cause, which is Western colonialism. Uh, and uh, at the very heart, there is an irreconcilable conflict, I believe, in the Middle East. It's not between peoples of different faiths or different nationalities. It's between the aspirations of the people of this region to have a decent life and real liberation uh, and what everybody in the world wants and the interests 
of outside powers who are intent on dominating the region. Uh, <clears throat> another one of the myths, and this gets to how did the modern Middle East come into being? Because I think there's also an assumption it's kind of always been the way it is, right? All those countries have been there forever and so forth. And that's completely untrue. The modern Middle East and the problems of the modern Middle East stem from two main developments. Uh, uh, one of them is World War I. And World War I is a fraught with all kinds of myths, too. You know, when they describe World War I, they say, oh, they used to say World War I was the war to end all wars, but that had to be dropped pretty soon because an even worse war came along. By the way, how bad was World War I? On the average day of World War I, which lasted for 51 months, on the average day, 6,000 people were killed. That's more than the, all the U.S. claimed uh, deaths in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. That happened yeah, on the average every single day. And uh, the other myth about World War I is that uh, it was a war to make the world safe for democracy. Well, when you looked at who was fighting on each side, that was a little bit hard to swallow. On one side uh, were the British, Russian, French, Italian, Dutch, Belgian, and Japanese empires. And on the other side were the German, Austro-Hungarian, and Turkish empires. So it was a war of empires. Empires are not, you know, and democracy don't exactly go together. Uh, and why were they fighting? And then later another country came into the war, the only one that wasn't officially called an empire of the big powers, and that was the United States of America, which was, of course, an empire. Uh, and the, uh, so the war, why were they fighting? They were fighting because they had divided up the world. As a matter of fact, 30 years before the start of the war, the war started in 1914, in 1884, there was a meeting in Berlin, Germany. It was called the Congress of Berlin. And at the Congress of Berlin, the European empires divided up the rest of Africa. Up until that time, most of the colonialism was along the coast, except for maybe a few areas like South Africa. But now they sat at, around a table in Germany and cut up the rest of Africa, and you get this, and you get this. And when you look at the map of Africa today, you see like quite a few straight lines. And is that because the rivers run extremely straight in Africa or the mountain ranges? It's because those lines were made with rulers. And they were made with people sitting around this table. And uh, this is also true to a certain degree to the Middle East as well. Mm -hmm. And the lines were drawn not for the benefit of the people in Africa, of course, but for the benefit of the colonizers. And really the source of much of many of the problems of Africa down till today are, uh, stem from what happened way back then. Uh, so they had, but they had divided up the world among themselves, and now they went to war to redivide the world. And at the end of the war, the winners of the war took over the colonies of the losers of the war. Uh, and, and some of the empires came, it was the end of them. The Austro-Hungarian Empire disappeared. The Turkish Empire disappeared. Uh, and in that war, the British uh, wanted, they're fighting on, against the Turkish Empire, which then controlled most of what was, is sometimes called the Levant, meaning what is Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, uh, Palestine, Jordan, that area. And the British sent a guy to the Middle East, some of you know about him. Uh, his name was T.E. Lawrence. He's been romanticized in a movie as Lawrence of Arabia. And Lawrence of Arabia went to meet with Arab leaders and uh, a monarch in the Hejaz region of what is today Saudi Arabia, which is another creation of Western colonialism. It wasn't Saudi Arabia then and said to them, if you will fight on our side against the Turkish Empire, when the war is over, we will support your right to have an independent country. Uh, at the same time as that was happening, the British and the French and the Russian foreign ministers were meeting in secret and talking about how they would divide up the Middle East after they had defeated their enemies and who would get what. Uh, and the, their, their deal at the time was that the uh, French would get what is present-day Lebanon and Syria and the northern part of Iraq, the northern province, which is Mosul province, the only province that was known to have oil. And the British would get present-day Palestine, Jordan, and the two southern provinces of Iraq. Uh, and this was a, but this deal was kept secret, of course, because they wanted to get the Arab people who resented the Turkish domination to fight on their side during the war. So that's actually how the borders of the modern Middle East came into being. The other big development of the time uh, that helped shape the modern Middle East and, and what's going on right down until this very moment um, was the rise of Zionism. 
political Zionism. I'm not talking about uh, religious Zionism, which is a private affair we have no opinion about, but political Zionism. And political Zionism uh, arose in the latter part of the 19th century in Europe as a reaction to anti-Semitic racism, to the racism against Jewish people, which uh, uh, sometimes took the form of pogroms, uh, Ku Klux Klan style massacres, and particularly in Eastern Europe and in the Russian Empire, uh, which then included also Poland and the rich, the nobility, when the peasants would get angry, you know, and start to rise up, they would try to divert their anger, deflect it away from themselves by uh, targeting the Jewish community and creating that kind of a hysteria. And that's not something that has been missing in the United States either, uh, the same kind of thing. So the first, uh, first it was a very small movement. The first Zionist settlers went to, from Europe uh, to Palestine in the early 1880s. Uh, they survived thanks to the help of the people who already lived there, much the way that the first white settlers in North America uh, were dependent upon the indigenous people. Uh, but it really got a boost in the, uh, it started to get momentum in the 1890s. In 1895, there was a trial in France, which was supposed to be more tolerant to Western Europe than Eastern Europe. And the trial was of a French uh, junior military officer named Dreyfus. This is made famous by Emile Zola in the book Jacques Pouz. And uh, he was convicted based on the creation of an anti-Semitic hysteria in France uh, by the French high command. And Dreyfus was sent off to Devil's Island off South America. And uh, covering the trial was a man named Theodor Herzl, who was an, uh, an Austrian journalist. And Herzl came to the conclusion, well, there has to be uh, a separate J Jewish state in order for Jewish people to escape from anti-Semitism. That his view would remain a very much a minority view among the European uh, Jewish population up until the time of World War II, and had virtually no support uh, you know, in the Middle East among the Jewish communities there. But the year after this trial, Dreyfus wrote a, uh, uh, not Dreyfus, uh, Herzl wrote a book called The Jewish State. And the next year there was a conference, uh, the first World Zionist Congress took place in Switzerland. And they debated, oh, if we're going to look for a state, where should it be? And they talked about maybe it could be in Uganda, which was the part of the British Empire. Uh, or maybe it could be in Argentina, which was technically independent, but part of the British Empire. But they were leaning toward Palestine based on, you know, biblical uh, references and so forth. Uh, even though uh, I have to say that the early leaders of the Zionist movement were almost exclusively themselves uh, atheists, didn't believe in any of that. Uh, but so they, they thought Palestine sounded good, but they knew nothing about Palestine at all. So they sent off a delegation uh, uh, to Palestine, and uh, the delegation uh, sent back a telegram, a very short telegram. And that short telegram has now been made the, uh, the title of a book. I don't know if you have it in your bookstore, but written by a Palestinian author named Radha Karmi. And she named her book using the words of the telegram. And what it said was, the bride is indeed beautiful, but she's married to another man. So the name of the book, I think their book is called Married to Another Man. In other words, Palestine is a beautiful area, but somebody else lives there. And this is very important because the myths are not just myths. The myths uh, take on a very important uh, purpose and a propagandistic purpose. And one of the foundational myths for the creation, for the Zionist movement and for the creation of the state of Israel was that Palestine was a land without people for a people without a land. And they never tired of repeating this. But here at the first World Zionist Congress, 50 years, half century before the formation of the state of Israel, the founders of the movement knew very well that it was not an uninhabited territory and that somebody else lived there. But there's another little twist to this which is very important. And that is that perhaps what they meant when they said a land without people was a land without Europeans. And in fact, that's not just the way the Zionist colonial movement uh, 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 viewed the rest of the world. That's how all of the European origin settler movements looked at where they were going. Certainly the ones who came here. They didn't uh, consider that they had to pay any, uh, uh, any attention at all to the rights of the indigenous people uh, uh, in North America. Um, and 
that's important because really there's a kind of a dual and seemingly contradictory character to the Zionist movement. On the one hand, it's a response to racism, real racism and, re and repression. And on the other hand, it has, it has a, a, in itself a racist ideology, a Euro supremacist ideology, what is more commonly referred to these days as a white supremacist ideology, where it doesn't have to pay attention to the rights of the indigenous people or any people of color. So that's one aspect of it, that it had a colonial, it was a colonialist movement from the beginning. And I'll read you a couple of quotes which kind of illustrate this. The other thing about it was <clears throat> that the organizers of the movement knew that in order to have any chance of success, they had to get the support of one of these empires. They were very weak. They were a small political movement, but they didn't have any uh, possibility of succeeding on their own. So they went to the Turkish Empire first, their representatives, Herzl and others, and made their case, why you, should you uh, we support us? And they went to the Russian Empire. And uh, I have a very interesting encounter in the book of Herzl with uh, a guy named Van Pleve in uh, Russia, in the Russian Empire. And he was the Minister of Interior, officially, but he was known as the Minister of Pogroms to all Jewish people uh, in, in, in the Russian Empire. And it had been the organizer of one of the most uh, deadly of these pogroms, where many people had died. And he, w and he was very happy about this. And, but when Kaim Weitzman, another leader of the movement, found out about it, when Herzl got back to him and said, great news, Van Plevy will support us. Uh, Weitzman said, are you crazy? Anybody finds out about this, our movement's dead. Uh, and, and, but then they turned to the British and, and focused more and more of their attention on getting the support of the British Empire. But when they went to talk to the leaders of these empires and their officials, they couldn't really go and say to them, we are oppressed people, can you help us? Because they're empires. Right? You know, the leaders of the empire might, if they were being honest, say, yeah, that's our business, oppressing people. What are you doing here? <laughs> they had to offer something in return. There had to be the quid pro quo. What we will do for you if you will do this for us. Uh, because otherwise, they're not even going to listen. So I want to read a couple of quotes. Um, and one of them is a letter from Theodore Herzl, who's considered the father of the Zionist, of the Zionist movement. A couple years before he died, he died in 1904. In 1902, he wrote a letter to a man named Cecil Rhodes. Everybody here know who Cecil Rhodes was? Yeah. He was the arch architect of British colonialism in Africa and also an arch racist and known for being so. There used to be two countries in Africa named after him, Northern Rhodesia and Southern Rhodesia, which have better names today, Zambia and Zimbabwe. But so he writes a letter, he's writing a lot of letters to people, figures in Britain. And he says to Rhodes, you are being invited to help make history. That cannot frighten you, nor will you laugh at it. It doesn't involve Africa, but a piece of Asia Minor, meaning the, middle, the current Middle East. Not Englishmen, but Jews. But had this been on your path, you would have done it by now. How then do I happen to turn to you because it is something colonial? And I read that because they weren't, there was nothing hidden about this. Before World War II, when colonialism became world, you know, unpopular worldwide, they were much more open about what they were doing. And then 12 years later, uh, uh, Herzl is gone and Kaim Weitzman is the leader now of the movement, living in England and writing lots of letters and talking to lots of people and eventually he would be successful. And he wrote this letter in 1914 on the eve of World War I. Should Palestine fall within the British sphere of influence, remember Palestine is still in the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire, and should Britain encourage Jewish settlement, we could develop the country, bring back civilization to it, and form a very effective guard for the Suez Canal. So there, in just a few words, are two ideas, the two ideas that I'm talking about. One of them is the Euro supremacist view, bring back civilization to it, as if there is not a long established uh, uh, civilization that already existed. And secondly, form a very effective guard for the Suez Canal, the quid pro quo, the offer. To be honest, the British were probably not that impressed by the offer 
to, of, of the Zionists to defend the Suez Canal, since at the time they had the largest navy in the world and the Zionists had no navy. <laughs> but it indicated the direction that they were going in that would turn out to, to come to fruition more at the time when the United States became the dominant power, and I would say is really the basis of the U.S.-Israeli special relationship today, uh, protecting U.S. interests in the Middle East. But you see the, what the intention was and the consciousness of the movement and what the movement was trying to do. Um, so finally, in 1917, um, in the middle of World War I, the Zionist movement gets its support from the British. And it's expressed in a famous uh, proclamation called the Balfour Declaration. And the Balfour Declaration, I'll read a little bit of it, it says, this is from the, Fr the British Foreign Minister, Foreign Secretary uh, Arthur Belfort. It says, His Majesty's government, meaning the British government, view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. And it's, it's important to note that the word civil and religious rights are there, but national rights are not, the word national rights. And this is what a Palestinian scholar, Dr. Ismail Zaid, wrote about the Balfour Declaration. It's interesting to note that the four-letter word Arab occurs not once in this document. To refer to the Arabs who constituted 92% of the population of Palestine as the non-Jewish communities is not merely preposterous, but deliberately fraudulent. Palestine did not belong to Balfour to assume such acts of generosity. So this is, uh, and five days after the Balfour Declaration, that was November 2nd, 1917, five days later, there's another big event in history, a bigger event, which was the Russian Revolution. And one of the first things that the new revolutionary government in Russia did after it was set up was it published the treaties that the old Tsarist foreign ministry had signed, including the Sykes-Picot Treaty. And this is how the world and the Arab people came to know about the Sykes-Picot Treaty. So the Balfour Declaration was news already. Now they find out very soon about the Sykes-Picot Treaty and understand that it's not just a betrayal, it's a double betrayal. That here they've been, you know, promised independence and uh, they're not, and, and instead, the. The, the land is being divided up. And not only that, but in the heart of the Middle East, part of the land is being given away, uh, being promised to a European, another European settler project. And I, one thing that's important to note about this is a, a lot of times it's put that the, the Palestinians oppose this, Palestinian Arabs oppose this because they were anti-Semitic. Uh, that's a lie. Uh, that's a falsif another falsification. At the time, the population of Palestine was about 75 to 80% Muslim, 15 to 20% Christian, and about 5% Jewish. The entire population was Arab. That sounds odd to people sometimes because we are trained to think the Arab-Jewish conflict. But all of the people there were. And the indigenous Jewish population in Palestine was very opposed to the Zionist project and believed that it would lead to, it would inflame the relations between different groups in Palestine, which of course, uh, turned out to, to, uh, to be very true. Uh, it's as false, though, in a general sense, to say that it's like saying that the Native Americans in North America were against the European settlers because they were anti-white. They were against them because they were settlers who were coming to take their land. And the Zionist movement, and I'll mention something in a minute, a quote that shows this, it, its intention was not just to come and live in Palestine, but to come and live in Palestine and replace a displaced indigenous population. So the Arab people that, you know, despite these things happening, had a different idea. This is a time of the nascent, the rising Arab national movement, which had become a full-fledged national liberation movements in several states after World War II, but started earlier. And right after the end of World War I, in uh, 1919, there was a meeting in Damascus, Syria, of uh, a Congress called the General Syrian Congress. And the General Syrian Congress was made up of delegates from what is present-day Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, and part of Jordan. 
and they met in Damascus and they declared a new state. And the new state was called Syria. And it would have included all of that area. That would have become the state of Syria. Uh, and they, they, they renounced the uh, Sykes-Picot Agreement and the, denounced the Balfour Declaration and they said this in their declaration, how can the Zionists go back in history 2,000 years to prove that by their short sojourn in Palestine, they have now a right to claim it and return to it as a Jewish home, thus crushing the nationalism of a million Arabs. So this, I believe, you know, the, we, we never hear about this, what could have been the modern Middle East, but what prevented it at the time was not really so much the Zionist movement, but it was the British and French armies. And the British and French armies moved in and they crushed the rebellions that took place in all of those areas and carried out the division of the Middle East in their interest. And, and, and uh, the, as I said before, the British got what is Palestine, Jordan, and Iraq, and the two southern provinces of Iraq, that was the deal. And the French got Lebanon and Syria, and they were supposed to get the northern province of Iraq, which was the only one where it was known that oil was at that time. But the British, while they were collaborating with the French on the one hand, were stabbing them in the back on the other, and they had moved their troops into northern Iraq and refused to leave. And it's very interesting, just to divert a little from the, the, the book for, to know this too, because the, the, the myths that have been substituted for the real history, uh, this is also goes for the history of Iraq and the United States. You know, in 20 years now, Iraq has been in the center of U.S. foreign policy. And in those 20 years, as far as I know, there's never been a program in mainstream media with a theme, how did the United States get involved in Iraq in the first place? I mean, it's not like right next door, you know, it's halfway around the world. Uh, and the reason I would submit is you can't go there. It's very dangerous to go there. The way that this all got settled about Iraq, back, way back then, for several years they didn't have a settlement. And finally in the mid-1920s, an agreement was reached about, and it said, okay, the British can stay, can keep all of what is present-day Iraq as their colony. But the oil of Iraq will be divided up five ways. 23.75% goes to British oil companies, the same to French, the same to the Dutch, you know, Shell, and the same to the American oil companies, U.S. oil companies. And 5% goes to a man named Kalus Gulbankian, who was an Armenian oil baron who engineered this deal, known in history as Mr. Five Percenter. <laughs> What's that add up to? 23.75 times 4 plus 5. 100%. So, until the revolution in Iraq in 1958, 100% of Iraq's oil was legally, officially owned by other, the, those other than Iraqis. And you can't go there because that's how the United States, the United States had no troops there in World War I. That's the beginning of U.S. involvement in Iraq. And so if you go there, you reveal immediately that all the talk about democracy, human rights, blah, 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 is all blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it's always been about oil, uh, as it is down to today. So, to skip ahead, I'm not going to go through the whole history at this rate, so you can, don't have to worry about that. Um, over with the, with the uh, sponsorship now of the British, and the British having crushed the rebellions that took place. You, by the way, you can go today to Damascus and Beirut, and you can go to Martyr Square, the Martyr Squares, and the Martyr Squares are where the French hung the people who rebelled, who resisted their takeover of the region. In Iraq in 1920, 10,000 Iraqis were killed and 2,000 British troops. So a serious fighting, including the British commanding general. Uh, that's how uh, uh, Iraq was brought into, into line for British colonialism. And the rebellions occurred all over the area. Over the next 15 years, there was a lot of conflict in Palestine. Uh, the population, the settler population by the mid-1930s rose to about 30%. From 1936 to 39, a recount in the book, I'm not going to go into it here, but there was a great rebellion in Palestine. It started with a six-month-long general strike uh, and followed by uh, three years of fighting in the countryside, guerrilla warfare. Uh, I used a pamphlet by uh, a great Palestinian uh, author, poet, political leader who was assassinated by car bomb by the Israelis in 1972 in uh, Lebanon named Rasan Kanafani and wrote a great pamphlet about this as the source and quote from him but at the end of it in 1939 
the British finally succeeded in crushing this rebellion, which was a very long-lasting one, right on the eve of World War II, which is, of course, the next big step in, in what's going to happen. So on the very eve of World War II, the Palestinians were in a very weakened position. Uh, their leaders were killed. Uh, some were sent into exile. There were emergency uh, regulations passed that said if a Palestinian Arab owned a rifle, could be hung for it. Meanwhile, the Israeli, what would become the Israeli forces, still the Zionist military forces that are being formed, uh, are strengthened by the British because the rebellion, the Palestinian rebellion, was against both British colonialism and the Zionist project. So as you go into World War, World War II, there's a big shift. And in World War II, many of the, uh, the, the Zionists were encouraged to go into the British Empire and fight. The Palestinians, of course, were not going to go into the British Army. They had just spent three years fighting the British Army, and it was a bitter situation. But some people say, well, why didn't the, why didn't the, the Palestinians welcome um, the, 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 the settlers who came and uh, take them in and so forth, both before and after World War II? And the e, as World War II is beginning, Joseph Weitz, Joseph Weitz was the director of the Jewish National Land Fund and one of the leaders of the Zionist movement, very important institution. It was, its job was to get land, which and there was nothing more important from their point of view. He wrote a letter to fellow leaders of the Zionist movement. And this is just one of many, many examples like this. And this is part of what he said. Among ourselves, it must be clear there is no room for both people in this country. And there is no way, besides transferring the Arabs from here to neighboring countries, to transfer them all. So <coughs> transfer was the code word for the expulsion of the indigenous population. And again, I want to say, I, this is not just one colonial movement that did this. It's not just the Zionist movement. This was the model in the United States. It's different. I, I, I talk about this in the book that Israel is an apartheid society. South Africa was an, was an apartheid society. But the Israeli model, Zionist model of settlement was more like the U.S. model than like the South African model. In that the South Africans cleared the African population, indigenous population, from some zones, but wished to exploit their labor, wished to exploit the African workers in the mines and the factories at very low, and did, uh, made enormous profits at doing this. The, Israeli, the Zionist Israeli model was like the U.S. model, which was an extermination model, which is destroy, remove, expel, kill the indigenous population. In the state of California where I live, 57 indigenous languages uh, no longer exist. Uh, between, and most of them were wiped out in 17 years, between eight, the time of the beginning of the gold rush in 1848 and eight, the end of the Civil War in 1865. 90% of the indigenous population was killed during that period. And it was, there was a bounty uh, offered for uh, turning in the scalps of, of indigenous people in California that continued up until the 1920s, actually. It wasn't revoked till the 1920s. So that was the model, and this was known by the Palestinians, that this is not just people coming to live here, this is people coming to replace us and to destroy us, uh, to get rid of us as a people. Um, <clears throat> another myth about the establishment of the State of Israel is that the U.S. and the British, the Allied powers, uh, uh, supported that idea after World War II because of either a, sympathy, or B, guilt over what happened uh, at the hands of the Nazis in World War II. I would submit that big power diplomacy and, ca and, and things like guilt, sympathy, et cetera, are mutually exclusive. That's not how they operate. Uh, and uh, in 1942, it became clear to Washington and to the British High Command what was happening in Germany, what was happening in Germany and Poland and in the death camps where millions and millions of Jewish people were killed. Two-thirds of the Roma population of Europe was killed. Millions of Slavic people were worked to death or killed, considered subhuman, and socialists, communists, gay people. Uh, you know, the Jewish population uh, like, and the Roma population were the ones that suffered the highest, by far, percentage of, of, of loss. Uh, and it was not just mass murder. It was mechanized mass murder, which is important, and that they were Bring, they had the rail lines bringing the uh, boxcars full of people, crammed with people, into these horrific death camps 
and they had the gas chambers and they were killing, killing, killing. And uh, there was an appeal made to the Allied High Command. If you're not going to have your troops on the ground soon, could, you could bomb the rail lines and bomb the gas chambers and that would at least slow down the rate of, of killing. And they refused to do it. They said it was not strategically efficacious. That was the expression that was used. Despite the fact that their bombers were actually flying over a lot of the, the refugee camps, it wasn't that they even had to go out of their way. It created such a stir inside, uh, inside the government. There was only one Jewish member of Roosevelt's cabinet, a man named Henry Morgenthau. Uh, from the Morgenthau family, he was the Secretary of the Treasury. Like all Secretaries of the Treasury, he represents big business, so he's not some radical. He commissioned a study inside the Treasury Department, uh, and, and the, this study uh, was to investigate what, what they were doing. And this is what part of what the study said. This is a very unusual thing in the history, I think, of the U.S. government. Uh, it came out in the, at the beginning of January 1944, and it said, one of the greatest crimes in history, the slaughter of the Jewish people in Europe is continuing unabated. The government, this government has for a long time maintained that its policy is to work out programs to serve those Jews of Europe who could be saved. I am convinced on the basis of the information which is available to me that certain officials in our State Department, which is charged with carrying out this policy, have been guilty not only of gross procrastination and willful failure to act, but even of willful attempts to prevent action from being taken to rescue Jews from Hitler. So this is one, you know, the, the, the government, our form of government, the cabinet system, they all has to, have to march in lockstep. Everybody has to say what the top says, and you know, they're all supposed to say the same thing. And this is the Treasury Department, in effect, accusing the State Department of trying to prevent action from being taken uh, to stop the, uh, or to slow down the mass slaughter that's going on. So why did the United States support the creation of the State of Israel after the war? I don't believe it was because their idea was that Israel would serve their interest, not, not, at least not at the beginning. I think that came later. I think it was, number one, because the, you, most of the surviving Jewish people, refugees after the end of the war, first preference was to come to the United States. There were about 400,000 people who survived. And there were millions of other people who were in displaced persons camps in Europe, some of them for, there for six or seven years, uh, waiting to get someone to accept them. After the war was a period of intense, uh, very soon after, a period of intense anti-communism in the United States, which became known as the witch hunt, McCarthyism, and so forth. And the government viewed the surviving Jewish population as, in general, radicalized and disproportionately socialist or communist, and did not want them in the United States. There was also a strong lobby in the United States that was pressuring the government to support the creation of, of the State of Israel. But I don't think it had anything to do with sympathy. When the war was over in 1946, you won't really be able to see this, but this will be another reason why you'll want to buy the book, uh, is a map. And on, it's three maps, actually, here. And uh, you can, I can just describe them. The map on this side is a map of the British colony of Palestine in 1946. The little dark dots, if you can see them, are the land that was owned by uh, the Jewish National Land Fund, the Zionist movement in 1946. It constituted 6.6 percent of Palestine. Most of it bought from absentee landlords. This next panel shows the U United Nations partition plan in 1947. Voted on November 29, 1947, the newly formed United Nations. The vote had to be two-thirds. It only passed because of intense pressure from the United States on countries it had a lot of influence over. And it awarded to the Zionist movement what would become the State of Israel, 55% of historic Pal of the British colony, 44% to the Palestinians, supposed to become a Palestinian Arab state, 1% an international zone around Jerusalem. And the third panel over here is how, what it looked like at the end of 1948, when Israel uh, made up 78% of Palestine, the West Bank, was annexed by Jordan, whose leader and who was really a puppet of the British, had been negotiating secretly with the Israelis to take over the West Bank, which became by far the most prosperous part of, of Jordan. And Gaza became, came under Egyptian administration, and there was no more Palestine. And in the West, very quickly, the name Palestine was just taken off the map, and it, was, it seemed to be gone. Uh, 
Now, there's a lot of myths about this, too. There's the myth, uh, uh, you know, that somehow it was a miracle that the Zionist and then Israeli movement won. The supporters of, of Israel will say somehow they won despite being surrounded by a sea of Arabs. They like the term sea of Arabs particularly. They like to use it. They use that term a lot. Uh, and the implication is that here were these big military forces and here was little, the little Zionist movement and then little Israel and somehow they survived and it must have been maybe divine intervention or something like that. But 35 years after the 1948 war, the Israeli military opened its file, unlocked the files that it had kept secret for all that time. And so a lot of Israeli historians, as well as Palestinian historians, uh, now you know, had, were able to see these. And uh, there was a succession of books by what are called the New Historians in Israel. And I'm, I'm citing them because of the fact that this is coming from inside the Israeli uh, society itself who document the fact that, and these documents show, that at every stage in that war, the Zionist and then Israeli side always had superiority in weapons, in funds, in resources, uh, military organization, and actual number of fighters in the field uh, because of their connection with, with the West. And uh, so, so it wasn't really a miracle at all, the, the outcome of the war. Uh, and then there's an, the other big development of the war, which continues down to today, and which I started talking about at the beginning, which is the Palestinian refugee issue the, and the Palestinian right of return issue. In the course of 1948, particularly in the spring and summer of 1948, uh, 750 to 800,000 Palestinians, more than three quarters of the population, were driven out. Um, uh, another myth that was perpetrated for a long time by the Israeli leaders was that they left of their own free will. They left because the Arab leaders told them to leave and that they could come back later with the Arab armies. Um, now, that's a bit illogical, uh, just on the face of it. For one thing, this is a mostly agricultural, rural population, agrarian population. You know, tell people, go out and tell farmers, small farmers, leave your farm for a few weeks or months and come back, everything will be okay. Um, they actually cannot do that. They have livestock, they have crops. I mean, you have to be there every day, actually, if you have a farm. Uh, people will only leave under, uh, in, in those circumstances, if they're forced to leave. And how are they forced to leave? They're forced to leave by means of terror. And what uh, came out also in these documents that were released after 35 years was that after the war had gone on for two or three months after November, the vote at the United Nations, the Israeli leaders got together, they were soon to be the Israeli leaders, still the Zionist movement, until May 14th, 1948, and said, this isn't working for us. Uh, we're winning most of the battles, but the population uh, in the villages where a battle is fought, they don't leave the area. They go two villages over and wait to come back. They're not leaving. And so they devised something called Plan Dalet. Dalet is the le fourth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, so they had A, B, and C. Now they had D. And it was implemented at the beginning of April of 1948. And it was, a, it was a strategy of ethnic cleansing. An Israeli historian, Ilan Pape, I don't know if you have any of his books here, but Ilan Pape has written a, a book recently called, the, uh, and he's an Israeli historian, called the, uh, the Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, documenting that it wasn't, there wasn't just one massacre or two massacres. There were many, many, many massacres where the quote-unquote fighting age men would be uh, rounded up and shot, or some of them would be shot, and the rest of the population would be put on trucks or marched, forcibly marched, to the nearest border, whether that was Jordan or Lebanon or Syria or Egypt. Uh, and it, this was the means by which uh, the expulsion of the, pop, of the population took place. It could not happen other, th other than that. So at the end of the, uh, here you have the, 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 uh, the version coming from Israel was, well, that's not our problem because they left voluntarily. At the end of 1948, the United Nations passed another resolution about a year after the partition. And this resolution called 194, Resolution 194, said that all the Palestinian refugees had to be uh, allowed to come back, they had to be restored to their property, and they had to be compensated for any damages. Down to today, not one has been allowed to come back. 
That resolution has been reaffirmed in the United Nations hundreds of times since then. The property of the Palestinians was seized. 536 uh, Palestinian villages were destroyed, bulldozed. This has been documented by a, a very, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, conscientious Palestinian demographer named Dr. Salman Abu Sitta, who's documented, the, but what wasn't destroyed was taken over. The, and it was a lot of, of great value. The uh, orchards, the olive groves, the buildings, the workshops, factories, the roads, this, the infrastructure of the country was taken over and served as a beginning basis for, for the, the state of Israel. Re Resolution 194 didn't distinguish between why people left. It said they all had to be uh, allowed back. It didn't matter if the story was true, that the, the false story about them having fled voluntarily or expelled by means of terror. But it's at this point that the, the myths start to crash into each other, to start to collide with each other the way, you know, sometimes when kids tell their parents too many different stories, they start to trip over them. Well, they, remember the foundational myth of the state of Israel was it was a land without people for a people without a land. <laughs> Well, why, if it was a people without a land, would we have to be debating in 1948 or 2010 the fate of the, what happens to the people who left, since they supposedly weren't there to begin with? Uh, so just to say a couple other things. Um, an, another one of the, the myths that goes down till today and is very, very important, and it's very important for us in the United States to, to believe is the picture that is painted all the time. It's Israel as victim. Or another way of putting it is, Israel wants peace, but it cannot find a partner for peace. This is repeated over and over and over again. Um, in actuality, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Some of the same Israeli historians who, uh, who are mentioning, but including some right-wing Israeli historians who got access to this material, because of course they didn't matter if you were right-wing or left-wing, uh, wrote about it. One who wrote a lot about this is a guy named Benny Morris, who thinks all the Palestinians should be expelled. But he wrote an important book called The Second Round. And the thesis of the book is this, is that between from 1949, the year after the establishment of Israel, up until 1956, a central aim of that new Israeli government was to have another war. And they wanted the war because... Uh, they wanted to take over the rest of uh, the British colony of Palestine, and more than that. So uh, this is very strongly supported, although you never hear this. Uh, in the year after, 1949, Moshe Dayan, who was a favored military officer at the, of ben, David Ben-Gurion, the first Israeli prime minister, who later himself became prime minister, told an American diplomat at a cocktail party in Tel Aviv Boundaries, frontier of Israel should be on the Jordan River. Present boundaries ridiculous from all points of view. This is one year after they've acquired 78% of Palestine. Our boundaries are ridiculous. The country is way too small. And embarked on a course uh, that would lead to the war in 1956 uh, and then a war in 1967 where Israel would seize the rest of uh, uh, the West, would seize the West Bank and Gaza and uh, the Golan Heights uh, part of Syria and the Sinai Peninsula, part of Egypt, um, that they would, but all of the wars and all of these incidents, it was very important for this to appear to be, to, and from the Israeli point of view, to make it appear that they were the victims and they were carrying out a policy of retaliation. And we should think all the time about the words that are used with, uh, you know, that we hear all the time. Like, what does the word retaliation imply? It implies that it's an act of self-defense, doesn't it? You are retaliating because someone attacked you. Well, this was very conscious in the minds of the, of the Israeli leaders all through this period that uh, we're going to take this territory, but we have to make it look like we're the victims. We're only retaliating. I would submit that that's what happened last year in regard to Gaza as well, and as, with equal falsity. Uh, so <clears throat> they pursued this course, and finally in 1967, they have the war where they seize the rest of, as I just said, of Palestine, <clears throat> and more. 
And this was presented in the United States. Well, the Arab armies were converging and they were about to attack Israel and Israel acted in self-defense. This was the standard version, I remember, and probably other people here do too. And it's the version that's maintained up till today. But it's not the version of the, the real version of the Israeli leaders. So 10 years after the war, not at the time, of course, because they all were sticking to discipline, but 10 years after uh, General Matiyahu Peled, who was one of the top Israeli commanders in the 67 war, said, the thesis that the danger of genocide was hanging over us in June 1967 and that Israel was fighting for, for its physical existence is only a bluff, which was born and developed after the war. It's pretty clear. 20 years after the war, <clears throat> the same Moshe Dayan I mentioned, who was not the defense minister during the 1967 war of Israel, described how they were provoking the war. And this is what he said. We would send a tractor to plow some area where it wasn't possible to do anything in the demilitarized zone. This is a zone that existed since 1948 between Israel and Syria. And we knew in advance the Syrians would start to shoot. If they didn't shoot, we would tell the tractor to advance further. They're not supposed to, it, no, neither side's forces are supposed to be in the demilitarized zone at all. So if they didn't shoot, we'd tell the tractor to advance further until in the end, the Syrians would get annoyed and shoot. And then we would use artillery and later the Air Force. And that's how it was. So in 67 is the accomplishment of the seizure, which continues up until today, except for Sinai, which went back to Egypt in the, in the treaty, which is a whole other story. Uh, in, in the Camp David Treaty. But down till today, Israel is holding this territory. And the West Bank, Gaza, they pretend is not occupied anymore, and they, uh, and they annex the Golan Heights of Syria. But the idea that Gaza is not, <clears throat> not occupied anymore is thoroughly ridiculous. It's like saying if you, were, if you took all the guards out of a prison and you surrounded the prison with tanks and machine guns, and then you said, well, the, all the people inside are free now. They're not occupied. That would be about what the status of Gaza is today. And, uh, the, and in regard to the West Bank, <clears throat> there are now 500,000 Israeli settlers. So they keep saying, we want peace, we want peace, but we don't have a partner for peace. That's the rhetoric for our benefit. And the reason it's for our benefit, it's not for the people in Israel. It's not certainly for the Palestinians who can see what's happening around them. It's because such a river of aid flows from here uh, that public opinion in the United States has to be cultivated. Um, so just two other points. One is, is Israel an apartheid state? I have a chapter on that. I have a chapter also in the book, of, is, does the Israeli lobby con control U.S. foreign policy which, in the Middle East, which I argue it doesn't. Uh, I think it's very influential, but I think, and talk in that chapter about the many, many things that the state of Israel has done for the U.S. empire. That's why we called the book Palestine, Israel, and the U.S. empire. But is Israel an apartheid state? About that, there's really, and this, this upsets the Israelis and the supporters of, of Israel very, very much uh, to, to hear this said. One reason is, is that apartheid is not just a bad thing. It's also an inter, it's a violation of international law. It's a crime against humanity an apartheid system. But listen to a couple of comments about this. You know, in 2008, a delegation of South Africans who had been active in the anti-apartheid struggle and had, had themselves suffered, they'd been imprisoned and tortured and, you know, the relatives killed and all that. Uh, they sent a delegation to, uh, to Palestine. And the editor, the guy who's today the editor of South Africa's Sunday Times, Mondli Makanya, uh, wrote a, a column, and uh, he said, when you observe from afar, you know that things are bad, but you do not know how bad. Nothing can prepare you for the evil we have seen here. It is worse, worse, worse than everything we endured. The level of apartheid, the racism, and the brutality are worse than the worst period of apartheid. I was shocked to read this. I was very active in the anti-apartheid movement uh, myself, but I mean, to, for him to say this. The apartheid regime viewed blacks as inferior. I do not think the Israelis see the Palestinians as human beings at all. How can a human brain engineer this total separation, the separate roads, the checkpoints? What we went through is terrible, 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 and yet there is no comparison. Here it is more terrible. And 
a few years ago, Jimmy Carter wrote a book called Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. I'm sure some of you have seen it or you know, maybe read it. I read it. I wrote about it at the time. <clears throat> I was glad he wrote the book. Inter it injected the idea. Many more people got to think about it than ever had before. I disagreed with him, uh, his contention that there was no apartheid inside the 1948 borders of Israel, because while the Palestinians, who make up 20% of the population, can vote there, which is a big contention, that, like, since they can vote, everything's fine. Uh, they are third or fourth class citizens in every other respect. Absolutely, no question about it. <clears throat> but uh, Carter got the treatment that you get if you criticize Israel, um, and that he was an anti-Semite. I mean, right away there was the chorus. He's anti-Semitic because he's criticized. That's the standard treatment, unless you're Jewish and then you're a self-hating Jew if you criticize Israel. Or the Jews, have you heard of it? Yeah, <laughs> right. So this is the formula, but I think it's kind of like running out of steam a little bit. But when he wrote it, uh, in the leading newspapers, leading circulation daily in Israel, a former minister of the Israeli government named Shulamit Aloni wrote a reply, an opinion piece, and the title of it was, uh, Indeed There Is Apartheid in Israel. And <clears throat> she described uh, the Jewish-only roads in the West Bank. She says, Wonderful roads, wide roads, well-paved roads, brightly lit at night, all that on pa stolen Palestinian land. When a Palestinian drives on such a road, his vehicle is confiscated and he's sent on his way. Then she tells a story about being out on one of these roads herself. She's driving, she sees that an Israeli soldier is pulled over a Palestinian and is in the process of confiscating his car. She asks why, the soldier said, it's an order, this is a Jews only road. Aloni continued, I inquired as to where was the sign indicating this fact and instructing other drivers not to use it. His answer was nothing short of amazing. The soldier says, it is his responsibility to know it, and besides, what do you want us to do? Put up a sign here and let some anti-Semitic reporter or journalist take a photo so that he can show the world that apartheid exists here? <laughs> um, the last point I want to make is, is about this, is that when we have demonstrations in San Francisco, um, we almost always, whether it's about the, middle, the wars or it's about Palestine, we had a lot of big demonstrations last year about Gaza. Um, as Patrick said, we have demonstrations coming up, and I think they'll be in many parts of the country too. The biggest ones will be in Washington and in San Francisco and Los Angeles about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and, uh, and the occupation, all the occupations, uh, and aid for Haiti, not occupation, and uh, money for people's needs and, and not for war. And at all these demonstrations, the pro-Israel forces come. In San Francisco, they're called San Francisco Voice for Israel. And uh, they do sometimes really disgusting things, like when there was a Gaza commemoration one year after, they came and they were on the other side of the street singing, we will rock you, as, you know, like, you know, celebrating the bombing that had taken place uh, in, uh, against Gaza. But they often carry signs that say, uh, Israel is here to stay. So we say to them sometimes, why do you carry those signs that say Israel is here to stay? It's the fourth, mo fourth or fifth most powerful military in the world. It's protected by the first most powerful military. It gets so much aid, it's been built up so much as a living standard. The living standard is 10 times what the Palestinians in the, in the West Bank have for a living standard. Coming with a sign like that is not, a, is not a, a, an expression of security. It's, in fact, the opposite, insecurity. And there's a, this is a constant thing that you hear from inside Israel and its supporters. Israel is here to stay. What is it that poses a threat to Israel, the state of Israel? Well, it's not the Palestinians. They're not going to militarily defeat them. All the Arab countries together cannot uh, think of defeating Israel militarily. Israel is the only country, uh, something that isn't mentioned that much in all the hysteria, hysteria about Iran, the only one that has nuclear warheads, has at least 200 nuclear weapons. What's the danger? And I want to just end by quoting a, a, who to me was an unexpected source about this. Um, his name was Menachem Begin. <clears throat> and some of you may remember him. Menachem Begin was a self-proclaimed terrorist before 1948. He was part of a unit. They said they were terrorists. They, they, were, they weren't hiding it. And, uh, and then uh, in, when he came to the United States after the, state of, after the formation of the State of Israel, in 1948, uh, 300 prominent Jewish Americans, Jewish people here, including Albert Einstein, took out an ad, full-page ad in the New York Times, and said, 
Don't let Begin in. He's not only a terrorist, he has Nazi tendencies. And I would just like to underline how heavy, you couldn't have made a more serious accusation within the Jewish community in 1948, three years after the end of World War II, than to call somebody a Nazi or say they have Nazi tendencies. And, uh, but he got in and, you know, despite all this, he became a member of parliament right away. And then later he became prime minister of Israel. But while he was a member of parliament in 1969, he, he became prime minister in the 70s. He visited a kibbutz, and this is, a, I think, says a lot. He visited a kibbutz, which is an Israeli cooperative farm. And, and, and uh, one of the people in the cooperative farm, in the kibbutz, used the word Palestine while he was, before, uh, before Begin spoke. And so this is Begin's response. My friend, take care. When you recognize the concept of Palestine, you demolish your right to live in Ein Ha'oresh, which is the kibbutz. He said, if this is Palestine, and not the land of Israel, then you are conquerors and not tillers of the land. You are invaders. If this is Palestine, then it belongs to a people who lived here before you came. Now that's quite a statement from Menachem Begin. And what it illustrates is what is really viewed as the threat, is that today in what was the colony of Palestine, the British colony of Palestine, a couple of years ago, for the first time since 1948, if you take West Bank, Gaza, and 1948 Israel, the Palestinian Arab population and the Israeli Jewish population have uh, became roughly equivalent for the first time since 1948. And if not today, then tomorrow, the Palestinian Arab population will be larger. Uh, and, uh, and so this is, I think, the existential threat that Israel faces, not in some you know, lofty philosophical sense of existential in a very fundamental sense of existential, the Palestinian people exist. They exist, and the idea of eliminating them, of wiping them off the map, you know, it was the Palestinian movement that, after the 1967 war, the independent movement, that through struggle, I would submit, actually put the name Palestine back on the map after it had been taken off. Uh, and they're still there. It's like uh, the, the plan has not succeeded. So now we're at this, we're at this stage where, what, what happens now? What happens now? Well, the, uh, when he spoke today, Barack Obama uh, reinstated, we support a two-state solution. But where's the, and I think that's always been a very dubious uh, idea, but where's the, where's the two-state? Where's the second state go? If there's 500,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank, which is a pretty small piece of territory, you know, with these settlements all over and their own roads and wherever the settlements and the roads are and the checkpoints are, the army is and so forth. Well, they're not planning on leaving. Um, last year, last week when Mitchell, who I mentioned at the beginning, went for another one of his fruitless trips to the Middle East, he met with Netanyahu and Netanyahu made a point of going that day to a settlement on the West Bank and planting a tree yeah. and saying, we're staying here forever. So where is it? Where does it? Where, I mean, the... What was offered to the Palestinians up until now, in, 19, in 2000, the last best final offer at the Camp David meeting there uh, 10 years ago, or nine and a half years ago, was that the, uh, and this was said to be the, the, the best offer they would ever get, <clears throat> and we kept saying, where's the map? Uh, and they, the maps never came out from the meetings for a couple of years afterwards. They were offered the West Bank divided up into kind of quadrants, unequal quadrants, with the Israeli settlements still there. And as I say, wherever the roads were, the, the Israeli army would stay. And also, the Israelis insisted that they controlled the borders of the West Bank, you know, like the way they control Gaza today, meaning you can control everything that comes and goes, including into Jordan, uh, who, who comes and goes, what comes and goes, when it's all shut off that Israel would control the airspace, the water resources, the subsoil rights. You could call it a state, but it wouldn't be like anybody else's state uh, or any other state that existed in history. So the two-state solution, is that, is that workable? Is Israel going to officially do what it's doing by creating so-called facts on the ground? And that is, are they going to officially annex the West Bank? Then what would they do because they want to maintain what they call the <coughs> democratic and Jewish state? which is a contradiction in terms, by the way. It's like, you know, they're saying to the Palestinians who live there, well, you must first agree that this is a white state. 
you know, to say that to people of color in the United States. Uh, that's a contradiction in terms, but they can't keep, if they, if they are next to the West Bank, then they, and, and uh, they would either have to carry out a new expulsion, which I think would be very hard to do today, or institute an official apartheid system that disenfranchised the Palestinians. And there's one other possibility, of course, but the, this possibility is treated as being the most ridiculous, radical, outlandish, wild idea that anyone could think of. And if you've thought about it, you should stop thinking about it right now. That's how it's treated in both Washington and, and in Tel Aviv. And that would be one state with equal rights for all people. That's treated as unthinkable. Um, uh, for the, just to say, for the Israeli leaders, the reason they think it's unreasonable, I just kind of explained. They want to maintain an exclusive state. Uh, for the United States, the United States is against it happening, too, for slightly different reasons. For the United States, they look at what happened with South <coughs> Africa. Uh, it wasn't much known, um, but when South Africa was an apartheid regime, it not only ruled over and oppressed the black people of South Africa, it was the agent of imperialism through all of sub-Saharan Africa. The South African forces were in Angola, and they were in Namibia, in Mozambique, uh, in the Congo. They were an arm of a military arm of imperialism. When they stopped being an, an officially an apartheid state, they ceased playing that role. And uh, I think that, it, that the idea of Israel continuing to play the role that it plays inside the US empire is contingent upon it continuing to be that kind of exclusivist apartheid state. Thank you for listening. Thank you.